final event involves you, so it's going to be the Ask a Scientist panel, and the panel is going to be led by uh, Dr. Sasha uh, Prokuda. Uh, from, she's the Director of Programs and Engagement at C2ST. She has a PhD in evolutionary biology from uh, UC uh, Riverside and a uh, bachelor's degree in biology from Penn State. But the most interesting thing about Sasha is for six months, and we, actually, I, that's the question I want to ask her. Why was it only six months? She was a bear technician. <laughs> and do you know what a bear technician does? So she was an expert on capturing black bears. Now, this job only lasted for six months, but you'll tell us why. Okay, so she's going to lead the, the Ask a Scientist panel, and I guess my question to her is already about the bears, so you, you think about questions about science for her, for the panel. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's going to be really hard following that great <laughs> uh, energy there, but well, we'll try. We'll fail, but we'll try. Um, so we have a great panel lined up uh, for Ask a Physicist. Um, as you're uh, listening to the research that they do, uh, log on to c2sc.cnf.io and you can ask questions online. We'll also take live, live uh, audience questions. We'll have a Mary over there with a the microphone running around, so just flag her down. Um, okay, first up, I'm going to reintroduce Mike. You've already heard about him. Um, Mike Turner is a theor uh, theoretical cosmo cosmologist who coined the term dark energy in 1998. He is the Bruce V. and Diana Ann Rahner Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago and was formerly the Assistant Director for Mathematical and Physical Sciences for the U.S. National Science Foundation from 2003 to 2006. Welcome back, Mike. We also have Dr. Jessica Esquivel. Is, uh, she is a recent PhD graduate in physics and is currently working as a postdoctoral research associate at Fermilab. <laughs> we have Dr. Chris, uh, Kirstie Duffy, and she is a physicist and Letterman Fellow at Fermilab. And last up is Dr. Don Lincoln. He is, a, he is a senior scientist doing research at Fermilab National Accelerator and is an adjunct professor of physics at the, at the University of Notre Dame. Okay, we are going to start off uh, by you guys uh, explaining what you do, because um, I think you can do it way better than I can. <laughs> so go ahead, uh, we'll start with you, Don. So I do my research using the Large Hadron Collider. What we do is recreate the conditions of the early universe, a tenth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. And uh, so that's mostly what I do. I also spend a significant amount of time writing uh, books for the public about science, so hopefully I'll be able to answer questions that you have. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I study neutrinos, which you've all been bored to death already about tonight, uh, so I won't bore you too much other to, than to repeat that they are uh, some of the fundamental particles that make up the universe, arguably these guys are going to argue with me, the most exciting ones, um, because uh, they do this really crazy thing where they change from one type to another, and because maybe they explain why the universe exists. I studied neutrinos in graduate school. Um, I also think they're super exciting. Um, I use machine learning, which is the same sort of software that Facebook uses for facial recognition. Um, so that was pretty much my grad work. Uh, I am now working on the muon G minus two experiment, so I jumped ship, which was really, really scary. <laughs> um, but it's also a lot, a lot of fun to, you know, do new physics and start a new challenge. Um, and I'm also very interested in outreach, diversity, inclusion work, and recently have been named the AAAS, if then, ambassador. So if you want to ask about what that is, I have answers to that too. <laughs> 
Um, so uh, I work on small things, how the universe began, uh, how it evolved to where we are today, what dark matter is, what dark energy is, and the ultimate fate of the universe. And, but then that leaves me some spare time, and as was mentioned earlier, uh, I am a senior advisor at the Kavli Foundation. So I spent 41 years at the University of Chicago, and, and uh, now I'm advising the Kavli Foundation. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, um, just a, since this is a Leon Letterman event, um, how, do you, uh, how do you think Leon's legacy lives on at Fermilab at, and at the University of Chicago? Anyone jump in? <laughs> okay, I'll start. <laughs> um, one of the things that really struck me about Fermilab was the fact that they really value diversity and inclusion and outreach and community engagement work. Um, and it was one of the things that uh, at a very young age, I saw physics and community outreach as hand in hand. Uh, as an undergrad in... Um, at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, San Antonio Texas, uh, you couldn't be a physics major unless you took a class every semester called Fiesta Physics. And what that was, was um, to do hands-on activities and just share the joy and the fun of physics to middle schoolers uh, around the area. So when I came to Fermilab, I felt that sort of um, just inspiring all, you know, of sharing what we're actually learning, sharing the, the cutting edge science that we're doing to the people that, that are around us. Um, and I, I, I attribute that to, to Letterman's uh, legacy, so yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's huge at Fermilab. It's funny uh, listening to these talks and people talk about back in the day when it wasn't really the thing to do outreach and to teach people. and. You know, I can't think of a single person at Fermilab that isn't involved in outreach and talking to young people um, and older people. <laughs> um, we have, like, tour groups coming in. We have Saturday morning physics where we have people who give up their Saturdays every week for 10 weeks, three times a year, both to teach and to come in. I don't think I would have done that as a teenager. Um, and, yeah, it, and it's a great thing for us as well because it's nice often to step back and do these sorts of things and remind yourself why you study these things and talk about questions like, why do you study neutrinos? Why are they interesting? How do they affect my life? Rather than, why doesn't my code work? And why don't I understand that graph that someone showed me? <laughs> well, his, uh, his impact, of course, is you know, significant in the science. So, I mean, without him, the Tevatron wouldn't exist, and that was uh, Fermilab's scientific program for 25 or 30 years. Um, but in a, on the outreach side, um, he certainly inspired me, and in first by writing his book, The God Particle, which I found um, inspirational and interesting, um, but even indirectly. He also hired uh, Rocky Cobb, who um, is a gifted public speaker and was an uh, inspiration to me when I was a much younger student, of course he's much older than I am, but, um, but, but the two of them showed that it was um, okay to do excellent science and to explain it, and that really gave, was a fundamental motivator for why I started writing books and doing the things that I do, because they showed that it was okay. Um, so I think um, Leon, inspired all of us to think big. So Leon always thought big. I, no one mentioned uh, uh, he invented Fermilab. He wrote a paper called the Truly National Laboratory, and so Fermilab was his idea. The, the idea of IMSA, I mean, IMSA is successful, had many fathers, but I remember Leon saying that, you know, we're going to create a math science academy and, you know, we're going to do it from scratch and it's going to happen very quickly. And um, he, he never thought small. Uh, one summer he called me up and he asked me what I was doing and I was at the Aspen Center for Physics and I said, oh, I'm trying to figure out what dark matter is. And he said, well, let me tell you what I'm doing. Um, I've got some lawyers here and we're going to put together a lawsuit and we're going to sue Hollywood for $5 trillion for the misrepresentation of science. And uh, I'm not sure the lawsuit ever came to, to pass. Wow. You would think you could find a lawyer if they get one-third of the... the, the uh, 
and he literally, uh, you know, he, he thought big. He uh, gave scientists permission to have public impact. In terms of talking about the impact on Hollywood, uh, David Salzberg gave us a colloquium at the University of Chicago last spring. Some of you may know he was the science advisor for all 12 years for the Big Bang Theory. And I wish I had had the opportunity to ask Leon, is this what you had in mind? And I know what the answer would be, it's an okay start. <laughs> you know, we, we need to do better than that. But he really, in addition to what everyone else said, he taught people to think really big and f don't worry about it being impossible. And I, again, I come back to IMSA. He told me that, you know, we're going to have this Illinois Math Science Academy. I thought, okay, that's really good, Leon. That's, that's, that's really good. You just keep doing what, what you uh, do. And some of those dreams come true. Great. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to our first question. I had others, but it's not necessary. <laughs> We're rolling along. Uh, what are the most important skill sets for young graduates looking to contribute to the field of physics? Mostly determination, I think. I mean, it, yes, of course, you have to have a certain amount of, uh, you know, training and, and, and intellect to do science research. But, you know, there's a, there's a lot of truth to the 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. The real trick is to be motivated and interested and, and determined and to never give up because most of the things you try will fail and, and it's just the nature of working on the frontier of knowledge. There is no, there's no roadmap to tell you what to do. You are making the roadmap and so you're going to make mistakes. But don't let those mistakes discourage you because then you'll stop. And so I think that's the most important thing is to just know, you know, put your, your eyes in the distance, know where you want to go, and keep on walking. That's great. Yeah, I... Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I think that's a really good point, because I think um, the biggest difference between school and becoming a researcher is that in school and also in university, uh, you're doing questions that your teacher has set you that have an answer, and you just especially maths and science, you, you do it until you get the answer right. And you always, it kind of ingrains in you this sense that like there is an answer and I just have to work out how to get to it. Um, and then suddenly you come into this world where maybe there's an answer, no one's gonna know when it's right or not. Um, and you have to be, there's a lot of determination, there's also a lot of bravery to be able to come in and say, I've done this thing and I actually don't know if it's right or not, but help me kick the tires and try and prove that it's wrong. And if we can't, then maybe it's right. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with what they said. Uh, one of the things I really like to say is to be okay with failure, which uh, Don hit on. And it's something, honestly, that I'm still working on. Um, but it's the f like the basis of the scientific, scientific method, right? You come up with a hypothesis, you test it, and sometimes it's wrong, and you move on. And that moving on is the hard part, right? Realizing that you failed, that you were wrong, um, that's what we as physicists do you know, on a regular basis. And to not internalize that and not think that there's something wrong with you because right at the onset you didn't come up with the right hypotheses, right? Um, and just, just be okay with you not always knowing what's coming next. And ruling out a hypothesis is also yeah, part of the I journey. Mean, that's. All of the graphs, pretty much, that you see are just, we ruled out this section. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. Um, I think somebody must have mentioned curiosity. Did I hear that? So curiosity, uh, passion. My definition of passion is that you think what you're doing, uh, the mystery you're trying to unravel is the most important thing in the universe at that moment. And then the last one I would add, and I sort of heard it, was humility. That uh, it turns out the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And uh, the, and well, we heard it in making mistakes, is making mistakes in science is really important. And you can look pretty silly sometimes. I remember, do people remember the experiment uh, where neutrinos went faster than the speed of light? And they made a mistake, but they reported their results. They, they tried as hard as they could to figure out what went wrong. And that in science is really important. It's just to say, this is what I found. Science is self-correcting. If I'm wrong, someone will figure it out. 
but that humility because we're out there, the fog at the uh, boundaries of discovery, it's very foggy out there and you don't know which way to go. And you, you said that the answer is not in the back of the book. You, it's, and the teacher who poses the question doesn't always know the answer. And I'd like to say one thing about that neutrino experiment. They, the, the, about the faster than light, they thought they found that it was faster than light. They reported it. They asked for help. Uh, people looked at it. Nobody found a mistake. They found a mistake. They reported that it was a mistake. They were honest that they screwed up. And it was okay as long as the goal is to, to look at the data and come to a conclusion that you can justify and is real. It's really, really important. It's one of the things about science that's so important is it can be, people are critical from the outside, but it's self-critical, and they were the ones that came up with the right answer. If I could just add to that, um, I'm sorry. Keep I it rolling. Add to the the, the self-correcting is an important feature of science that I think uh, Leon would want the public to understand is making mistakes is okay. Science is not authority-based, it's evidence-based. And so if you make a mistake, it will get corrected. Even if there is people doing something intentionally wrong, fraud, it gets corrected. And that's one of the beauties of science because the more outrageous the claim you make about, oh, I can do this or that, people are gonna go check it because they want to extend it. And so uh, that self-correcting nature of science, the evidence-based, you're only as good as your last experiment. It doesn't matter if Leon told you something is right. He would say, don't believe me, go out and do the experiment. All right, uh, we'll turn to the audience. Does anyone have a question? All right. Thank you. Um, in your opinion, could you share some of the most exciting unanswered questions in physics? <laughs> Is that directed to a specific person? Well, I just brainstorm. Each of you can get your own. <laughs> like, uh, where should the next scientists we... start focusing on? Because a lot of stuff is being discovered. What is going to be the next big thing or the next exciting question that have yet to be answered? I'm totally biased because <laughs> I am now working on the muon G minus two experiment, um, which when I joined, I didn't think it was that interesting <laughs> because we were making a very precise measurement. Think just a whole bunch of decimal places um, to an already made or already done experiment in the 80s. And I was like, what's the big deal? But <laughs> it is actually really exciting. Um, so what we're doing is um, looking at muons dance, right? Uh, muons dance in a magnetic field, and we have a really big magnet. Um, and what happens in a vacuum is that virtual particles, ghost particles, um, pop in and out of existence. And theorists have a pretty good idea of which of these particles should be popping in and out. Um, but the more precise the measurement you make, the more weird physics you get to see. So it's a really good way to probe the unknown without having to go to such high energies. Um, and I think that's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, I want to add to that. I think one of the things uh, a lot of people are excited about is what we call beyond the standard model physics. Um, Joe, at the beginning this evening, he showed us uh, a little picture. Um, and we saw it later in the physics time as well. And he said, these are the particles. And there's you know three by four. Um, and that's kind of part of what we call the standard model of particle physics, which is these are the particles that exist and they make up everything. And there's a whole load of theories that go along with it. And we often put it up on slides like that and say it like it's true. And like, these are the particles, that's what exists. Now we're studying them. Um, but one of the reasons I'm excited about neutrinos is that neutrinos don't fit in that theory. Um, they've already got some features, like the theory says that neutrinos are completely massless. And we know that that's not true. They have mass. It's very tiny. We've never been able to measure it, but it's there. Um, and that's exciting because it proves that our best theory of what's going on in the universe is wrong. Um, and we don't know how and we don't know why. So a lot of the experiments that we're doing right now are just kind of trying to throw everything against the wall and test it and see if we can find out where it's wrong. Um, and the other thing about that is I think it can often feel like physics is done, um, like, you know, 
back in the 60s, they didn't know about the muon neutrino, but now we do. What are we going to find next? Um, and, and that's not true, because the standard model we know is broken, so we know we don't know everything, and there's new stuff to find. We just need to work out what it is. Um, I'd actually like to think a, a little bit bigger than this, because the, the idea of, of particle physics and cosmology, the goal is, is really quite arrogant. It is to understand everything, to understand how the universe came into existence, um, the rules that govern the universe, do, uh, does the universe have to be the way it is? Could it be different? I mean, these are what what one might call philosophically existential questions. And that is sort of the goal, the deep, long-term goal of particle physics. So there's a lot of things that we do know. We know the standard model. We know about a, a thing called general relativity, which governs the, the cosmos. But there's an incredible amount that we don't know. For instance, the matter that makes up you and me, the reason I can't put my hand through this table, this matter is about 5% of the matter and energy of the universe. 95% of the universe, we don't know. Something like 25% of it is a thing called dark matter, we think, and 70% of it is a thing called dark energy, which causes the universe to expand faster and faster. 95% we don't understand, so that's a real biggie. Another thing is you've heard E equals mc squared which says that matter can turn into energy and energy can turn into matter. But it's really true that energy can turn into a thing called matter and antimatter. Antimatter sounds like science fiction, but it's fact. And according to every measurement we have made, that matter and antimatter should be made in equal quantities. So now you go back to the beginning of the universe when it was younger and hotter and the Big Bang, the, the universe was at very high temperatures. Um, that energy that was there should have made matter and antimatter in equal quantities. Yet you look around at us, you look at the solar system, the galaxy, the entire cosmos, all you see is matter. So where did the antimatter go? This is an enormous question that the neutrino experiments at Fermilab are trying to get their, their head around. So these are, are two really big things. Another question is the Big Bang. What banged and why? And was there a before? What will the end of the universe be? We sort of think we might know that. So these are some of the really big questions. There are more, of course, and if we had time, we could go through a bunch of them. But the, the thing is that we really are thinking big. We are, as, as Michael said, we're, as Leon suggested, think big. Think about nothing other than answering all questions. And that's going to keep us in, in work for quite a while. Well, I thought I was going to top Don with big questions. Uh, I'll try. Uh, where did space and time come from? And why is there something rather than nothing? But then uh, I think part of the question was, what is, uh, what is a big question that we may answer soon? And um, nobody's touched upon it, life elsewhere in the universe. And um, I, I'm happy to, to bet with anyone that in the next 20 years, we will find evidence of life somewhere else in the universe. Um, and that, that's, that, that is a really, I didn't say intelligent life because we haven't found that on Earth yet. But uh, uh, I think that's amazing. The question, are we alone? And what are the implications? And uh, the Fermi paradox. We'll talk about the Fermi paradox at dinner. But uh, how many people have heard of the Fermi paradox? Yeah, so that's sort of an amazing question. OK. I'm going to read you this next question. And now I'm going to throw a curveball at you. We need to answer everything in 30 seconds or less. Okay. Impossible. <laughs> Who's enforcing that? Me. I have the whip. Are there other candidates for dark matter other than neutrinos? There are a lot of candidates. That's not, the, the problem is not, um, are there other candidates? There are many candidates. So the trick is to figuring out an experimental way to determine between them. So yes, there are many, many possible candidates. Theorists are very, very clever. They have a new idea every day. Very well done, all right. Just to add, neutrinos are some of the dark matter, but they're not the bulk of it. They're just the spice. Great. Do we have an uh, audience question? Any idea what Leon would tell us to do about climate change? Not a physics question, but... A any idea what Leon would say uh, that we should do about climate change? Fix it. <laughs> We're doing better than 30 seconds now. This is, this is great. 
Uh, so what is the fate of the universe? Will it collapse in a crunch, expand endlessly, or something else? Oh, that one's easy. We don't know. <laughs> and uh, that's the best thing about science, are all the things we don't know. And uh, they, the answer to that one hinges upon what dark energy is, and we don't know what dark energy is. So that, that's a wide open question, and I hope someone at IMSA or someone, you know, it's going to be the next generation that figures that out. But that's a big wide open question. Okay. What are your best bets, just real quick? Well, Michael's the expert, but the, the fact is, if dark energy is what we think it is, the expansion of the universe will continue to get faster and faster until it, what will happen is that um, distant galaxies that we can now see, we will never, we will eventually not see. All we see is a handful of galaxies that are near, um, that, that we that are near our, the Milky Way, and eventually, and this is sad, the stars will go out one by one, and it will be a dark and cold death to the universe. Beautiful. Was, <laughs> warms my heart. I wanted to cheery ending. <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah. Um, with all this new information, um, I keep thinking, will we soon be able to time travel and with our bodies to travel in time to the past? We can already do that. The telescope is a time machine. So... Uh, the more powerful telescope we have, the further back we can look in time. I'm, I mean, as a human being in a human body. Oh, you want to actually travel back. Well, you're going to have to invent that one yourself. <laughs> but it, isn't it pretty cool that when you look at a power tel powerful telescope, you can, the, with the optical light, the farthest back that we can see right now is uh, to within about 500 mil million years of the Big Bang. When, when the universe was about uh, a tenth of its present size. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? But the IMSA kids should get cracking on this, is what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite flavor of neutrino and why? <laughs> Muon neutrino. That's literally five years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I would say electron anti-neutrino for the same reason. <laughs> We have an audience question. Uh, the last two presenters on the stage uh, were, were talking about the Big Bang and how initially all this matter accelerated faster than the speed of light. As far as we know today, light is the fastest speed in the universe. But again, it's what we know today. So that's, that's a simple one. You're not going to like the answer, though. But it is a simple answer. So um, in Einstein's theory, the, the limit that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, that's the speed with which you can move through space. But the Big Bang was uh, not an explosion of things into space. It was an explosion of space itself. So in Einstein's theory, there's no limit on how fast space can expand. And so the expansion of the universe is a, a cosmic land boom. It's, it's space getting bigger. And everything gets carried along, in, including photons. And now to really make sure you don't have a follow-up question and to give you a headache. So in the expanding universe, light travels faster than the speed of light if you take into account that it's being dragged along by the expansion of space. And this isn't just in the past, this is in the now. Distant galaxies are traveling away from us at nearly the speed of light, and because the expansion of space is getting faster and faster, those um, objects will eventually travel away from us faster than light. And it's because the expansion of space is not governed by this. It's traveling through space is the only thing that's governed by it. What are some disadvantages of using thorium in a nuclear reactor? I don't know. <laughs> Ask Cindy. Bike down. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. Anyone? It's supposed to be safer, but I'm not an expert. All right. Yep. 
Hey, um, this is for uh, Jessica, but whoever else as well. Um, how does how's machine learning being integrated into fundamental physics when it's like curve fitting, right? So how, how can it complement kind of theory and, and experimental measurement? Yeah, so uh, the way I used it was actually to train a neural network or a computer to recognize different um, particles in a specifically my detector, liquid argon detector. Um, so just like when you, I know I don't know why I'm pointing up there, but <laughs> um, just like when you're on Facebook and you start, you know, uploading photos, and all of a sudden it says you want to tag people, and it always puts the box around people's faces, right? That's a network that has been trained on faces, recognizing eyes, recognizing noses, recognizing mouths. Um, but then after you start uploading and tagging yourself, all of a sudden you start seeing, oh, do you want to tag yourself? And the box around your face has already been labeled as me or you. <laughs> um, so I did the same thing. I fed in a whole bunch of different particles um, as images. Uh, really, they're just lines and kinks, right? But as a particle physicist, you learn to recognize lines and kinks as muon neutrinos or stuff that I don't really care about. <laughs> um, so you train the network uh, on a whole bunch of different images and then you throw an image um, or an event that it's never seen before and hope to God that it works. And you know, five years later, it, it, it works. <laughs> um, so really, uh, that's pretty much the, the future of analyses when it comes to liquid argon neutrino detectors. I wasn't the only one that was using machine learning um, and we're using it in all kinds of, of, of ways. Uh, it helps graduate students' eyes because we're not looking at thousands and thousands of images anymore. We can have a computer do it for us, so. Um, yeah, actually, fun fact, back in the day when they had some of the first particle physics detectors, they literally would take a photo of it, print it out, and have someone with a ruler measure things and then say, this was a muon, and it had this much energy. Um, and it, you know, now we can replace it with computers because what we get out of our detectors is essentially still pictures. Mm -hmm. um, but we can also use it um, in other ways where we can tell it, we can use machine learning algorithms where we tell them more information than just the picture. We can tell them things like the energy that something deposits. Um, and we can tell them things like, I'm looking for a neutrino interaction and I know that a neutrino interaction looks like this and I know that not a neutrino interaction looks like this. Um, and they can, if you train them right, they can pick up on things that you don't even know that you're putting in. Um, and so they can get much more subtle distinctions between things that we might not be able to pick up if we just tried to write it out ourselves to start with. Okay, we're almost out of time. We're just gonna try and squeeze in, squeeze in two more questions from the audience. What is space? <laughs> what, 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 was the what, is what is space? space? What is fate? Space. space. Oh, what is space? Oh, uh, oh, I'll take that one. Uh, we don't know. Um, but it's, it's a great, it illustrates asking questions is really important. So uh, Newton was asked that, and he said, go away. They're, they're just where things happen. It's the arena. Uh, Einstein came along and he didn't answer the question, but he made one step, which we've already talked about this evening, which is space and time are dynamical. Space can stretch, time can warp. And uh, one of the questions that string theorists are hoping to answer is what are space and time? And the answer that they're giving, and don't expect, expect to understand it, I don't understand it, is that they're emergent phenomenon that they are not fundamental, that there was, I can't even say there was a time, that you know, space and time emerged at some point. They're not fundamental. So it's asking big questions, asking questions in science and getting confused, asking the wrong question. That happens 90% of the time, but the most important thing is to ask a question. That's a great question. Okay. One Hi. more. Hi. Sorry. Um, so imagine the vast world of, of non-scientists um, in your world. Conjure up an image of high school students or the current uh, White House um, occupants or what, what you wish. Um, what scientific principle, what single scientific principle or fact are you most frustrated 
that the average um, adult does not know and what scientific principle or fact you wish that every single human on earth would, would know. Maybe they're the same thing. I think that science is tested. If it's not tested and it's not demonstrated by the data, then you shouldn't believe it. I think that's the most important thing. Empiricism is the core of science. And I, yeah, I think that's probably it. Oh, one other thing is that, and that every measurement has an uncertainty, and that's okay, as long as you don't use that uncertainty to, to say, well, we don't know anything. We actually usually know the measurement, and we know it very precisely, but knowing exactly how well you know it is really an important thing. That I don't study dust particles. <laughs> That particle physicists don't study dust particles. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had to kind of tell my mom that that's not what I do. <laughs> oh, I was going to say what Don said. <laughs> Great minds. I think, well, I would add to Don's and say that I would like people to know that, as Don said earlier, the strongest criti critics of our science are us. And, you know, this is a community where a lot of the time what we're trying to do is disprove things that other people have told us. And so if we do get together and settle on something, it's because I've tried my hardest to prove that you're wrong and I can't. Um, there's never some sort of shady scientist getting together to fool the world into thinking something because we're not that organized. <laughs> you mean it's not flat? <laughs> Anything from you? Um, so I think people, what I've learned in 40 years of teaching is people have a hard time understanding what science is. And so every course I end up spending a, a, maybe even a week talking about it. And if I had to uh, try to summarize it, science is the most powerful method. Uh, I'm not sure anybody could describe the method. Everybody would describe something different. It would be you know, like describing an elephant, the blind man describing the elephant. But it's the most powerful method that we've ever figured out uh, yet to explore the physical universe. Um, and that's what it's really good at, just like a plumber being really good at fixing plumbing. Sci science is not going to tell you how to live your life. It's, it's not going to, you know, fix a broken marriage. It's not going to... Uh, so we're limited. We, what we do, we do exquisitely well. If you want to know about the physical universe and how it works, we do how. We don't do why uh, in science. We do the how, and we do it better than anyone. If you want why, go to somebody else. And uh, so science is extremely powerful, but it also has its limits. And so th those would be the two things that, that I'd want to say. And then I would hope that would start a conversation to say, oh, how do you do how? And uh, what have you learned about the universe? Okay, thank you so much. That was great. <laughs> and at least some of our scientists will be available afterwards if you have some pressing questions that you want to ask. Uh, Mike, did you want to finish us um, off? I, you know, it's impossible. Leon had such impact in science. Uh, in uh, science education, two hours did not do, we did a great job, but two hours just didn't do justice. I want to thank uh, everyone for coming, and I want to remind you to fill out the survey that is, oh, it's up there, and there's a hundred dollars, somebody's going to get a hundred dollar prize, or um, am I getting that? Fifteen. Sorry? <laughs> Fifteen. Fif I don't know, Alan said he was going to match the fifty, and it was going to be a be hundred. And I just want to one thing I, uh, Leon was lovable. And I remember when Leon won the Nobel Prize, he was not the first person in Chicago to win the Nobel Prize. But I remember reading the Chicago Tribune and every Nobel Prize that involves Chicago, you know, we're proud of it. But Chicago was happy for Leon. This is someone that Chicago, he wasn't born here. Uh, he was at Columbia longer than he was, was here. Chicago really loved Leon, and they rejoiced when he got the Nobel Prize. And I hope people go away a, a little bit tonight, some of the stories and some of the impact, why uh, Chicago and why the world uh, loved Leon. He, he, uh, he had impact. 
He cared about people. He was approachable. Thank you all for coming.